We talked about how your mitochondria are your important energy making factories and how the way we've been eating is basically giving them rush hour almost 24 hours a day and no wonder energy is slowed to a crawl. So with that in mind, we've got to take the work off of our mitochondria. Mitochondria can handle sugars as a fuel source. Mitochondria can handle proteins as a fuel source, and mitochondria can handle fats as a fuel source. But they shouldn't arrive simultaneously waiting to get processed. We can use one fuel at a time. And in the book, it's called a mono diet. A mono diet is you're gonna rely on either mostly carbohydrates or mostly protein or mostly fat as your first meal of the day. We're gonna do that because your mitochondria in this program are gonna get a nice long rest period while you're sleeping. And as we'll talk about in just a second, the longer we can give them to rest and recover from the onslaught that you've been giving to them, the more efficient they'll get at producing energy. They'll actually want to work for you. So one of the tricks that's unique to this program is the first meal of the day, your break fast, is going to be a mono meal. It's going to be either a very high protein meal, kind of like an Adkins diet, or conversely, a quite a high carbohydrate meal. If you want to have a bowl of puffed millet with almond milk, knock your socks off. You can have it as your first meal. I know people are going, what? I can do that? And in fact, if you want to do that on Monday, and then have, say, naturally raised Canadian bacon on Tuesday, have an avocado with two egg yolks under a broiler on Wednesday, go back to your millet cereal on Thursday, have a wonderful time. The beauty of this program is your first meal of the day is not locked in but I ask you to either make it a carbohydrate-based meal, a protein-based meal, or a fat-based meal, and don't blend them at this point. Why? Because you and I only want one set of fuel arriving at your mitochondria, particularly after a long rest period. We want to wake them up you know, with a lullaby rather than heavy metal, like I talk about in the book. So that's a unique trick. And it actually explains why mono diets in general are actually so effective. Believe it or not, there's a Duke rice diet where, you guessed it, all you eat is rice. And the Duke rice diet is actually really good at weight loss, really good at controlling diabetes. Why? As you learned in the book, is because it's taking a load off your mitochondria. Same way with an Adkins diet. An Adkins diet, the, the new Adkins diet was a high protein diet, but the old Adkins diet was an ultra high fat diet, what we now call a keto diet. But both were very effective, including uh, Robert Samuelson's diet, the drinking man's diet, which was the precursor for Adkins, it was giving your mitochondria one fuel source and one fuel source alone. And as long as you did that, you took the work off. I'll give you a, a wonderful example. Um, I, as you know, spent a lot of time driving in Italy and France, uh, visiting small villages. And on Sundays on the Autostrasse in Italy, trucks are banned from any of the interstate highways. And what happens on Sundays is the removal of, we'll call trucks fat, 
just for fun. We'll call buses protein and we'll call car cars carbohydrates. Eliminating the fat from the highways on Sunday, the interstates moved unbelievably. If you were on those interstates any other day and we reintroduced the trucks, things crawled. So in Italy, they did that because people were enjoying the weekends. And so trucks were banned in Italy on the highways. What we want to do is the first thing that hits your mitochondria is just one transportation vehicle, either a car or, or a bus, but eliminating all the cars, trucks, and buses simultaneously. And it really makes a difference. Okay, so what's the next thing we can do? Well, the next thing we can do is if mitochondria are overworked, what we want to do is limit the amount of rush hour that mitochondria have to deal with. And one of the most exciting developments that I actually wrote about in 2006 in my first book, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, is timed controlled eating, sometimes known as intermittent fasting, sometimes known as time-restricted feeding. Uh, believe it or not, time-restricted feeding came from my studies. But whatever we want to call it, limiting the hours of the day that you actually ingest food and thereby make your mitochondria work to produce energy, the more we compress that eating window, the less work, the less rush hour there is for your mitochondria. Now here's the deal, the average American usually is eating something 16 hours every day. And hopefully they're in bed for the other you know, eight hours of that time period. So, or rather, eight hours of that time period. So that 16 hours is a long time to be bombarding your mitochondria with work. Imagine what would happen if we only gave them 12 hours to work and they had 12 hours off. Well, this work was done by Dr. Sachin Panda in San Diego who found that he, if he got human beings to reduce their eating window by 12 hours a day, and believe me, that's not much. That's starting at 8 o'clock in the morning and finishing at 8 o'clock at night. That he dramatically improved their health, improved their weight, and recent studies show, particularly by Dr. Matson from the National Institutes of Aging, if we could reduce that eating window even further to six hours a day, the health benefits, the energy benefits, the mental protection benefits, the heart benefits, the lack of diabetes, everything falls into place. So, the more we can compress rush hour, the better off your mitochondria are going to function. And one of the things we're realizing that why that is, making energy for you is extremely hard work. It's literally being on a factory line under sweatshop conditions and damage is done to your mitochondria every day in the process of making energy. And many of you have heard of what are called reactive oxygen species, or ROSs. So these are, if you will, the byproducts of making energy. And those of you who are old enough to remember before synthetic motor oils, you used to have to get your motor oil changed, oh, every six months, every year, every 5,000 miles, because sludge would build up in your motor oil from the process of combustion. 
and that sludge would damage the valves, damage the rings, and if you didn't throw out that sludge and put in new stuff, your engine wasn't going to last very long. It's the same way with mitochondria. That sludge from the process of making energy, of producing ATP, literally builds up and damages your mitochondria. So the mitochondria has a wonderful repair system, has a wonderful set of antioxidants, and we'll get into that in a little bit. In fact, just as a teaser, melatonin, which most of us think is the hormone that makes us sleep, is actually the major mitochondrial antioxidant. And my personal feeling is the reason melatonin is produced to make you go to sleep is guess what? You can't eat when you're asleep unless you're one of those sleepwalkers. So melatonin is produced to put you to sleep and the melatonin that's produced during the night is actually helping repair your mitochondria. And because you're not eating, your mitochondria are kind of on the night shift and they power down. You don't need as much energy. So they don't have to injure themselves as much, but more importantly, they can spend that time to undergo repair work. Let me give you an example. Believe it or not, I spent a lot of time in the freeways in the early morning hours going back and forth between Santa Barbara and Palm Springs. And when does repair work on freeways happen most of the time? It's in the middle of the night when there's very little traffic. And exactly the same thing happens in your mitochondria. The repair work happens when there's very little traffic. So imagine what can happen if you have 12 hours to get repair work done. Imagine what can happen if you have 14 hours to get repair work done. How about if we have 18 hours to get repair work done. The longer we can get you to not eat, the more opportunity your mitochondria have of repairing themselves and keeping you in tip-top condition when they do have to do the work. And that's the importance of time-controlled eating or what we call C squared chrono consumption. Now the good news is tomorrow you don't have to drop to a six hour eating window. I'm not going to say, guess what? Tomorrow morning, on Monday morning, you're not gonna eat until noon. Because quite frankly, most of you will never make it to there. So we're gonna step you down every week, every day, slowly. So for instance, on week one, We'll have you eat break fast at 7 o'clock in the morning. But on Tuesday, you'll eat it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Just one hour difference. On Wednesday, we'll go to 9 o'clock. On Thursday, we'll go to 10 o'clock. And on Friday, we'll start eating at 11. Now, the good news is, weekends are off. You get to do whatever you want. What kind of crazy program is that? It turns out that looking at human studies, we can achieve everything we want to achieve with time-restricted eating, time-controlled eating, if we give you the weekends off. How do I know this? Because for the last 21 years, I've been doing time-controlled eating during the week and taking the weekends off. And I've allowed that to my patients There's to do. There's studies that show you'll be more likely to stay with this program if I give you the weekends off. Then next week, we're going to step up one hour. So instead of eating breakfast at 7 next week, we're going to start at 8, and so on. So each week, we're going to advance an hour. And by the end of six weeks, you'll think nothing of breaking your fast, having break fast, at noon. And just wait what happens to your energy levels as each week passes. To summarize, we want to take rush hour away from your mitochondria. We want to, number one, as the first meal of the day, give them 
either carbohydrates or protein or fat as the first meal. So they only have one fuel to work with at a time. Then the more we can compress your eating window, the less work, the less rush hour for your mitochondria, number two. And number three, the longer the period you go without forcing your mitochondria to work, the more time they have to repair themselves and get a little downtime for themselves. And just like any worker, you give a worker a little downtime, they come back refreshed and ready to go to the job, not throwing things in your way anymore. So that's mono meals and time controlled eating, two keys to this program. If you found this video helpful, I think you're gonna love this one. And there are various theories about what causes your irritable bladder. And obviously the first that comes to mind is a acute or a low-grade urinary tract infection, a 